Fellow NHS members, ladies and gentlemen, you heard a talk this morning from Elizabeth that uh, personified one of the hallmarks of a great director, Elizabeth, courage. Without courage, one cannot be a good director because you're actually taking risk for award. And you, as you accept the appointment, you put your personal reputation and your personal estate online. And that's exactly what Elizabeth did. And your spirit of uh, forgiveness, Elizabeth, is you have reached that wisdom of spiritual freedom. And if you don't reach it, one becomes one's own jailer. And uh, it's been a privilege for me to sit and listen to you this morning. Thank you very much. I, I learned a lot from what you said because I have lectured around the world and spoken around the world and have spoken about this element of courage of being a director. But today you displayed it and you spoke about rehabilitation. You are rehabilitated. The fact that you can stand here among your colleagues and talk about your own experiences, the tragedy, your personal tragedy, uh, is a complete rehabilitation in my judgment. And I think uh, it was very brave of you to come here today and talk. But in doing so, you also made a few statements which I think should be eye-opening to all in the, in, the, in the NHS. You spoke about the silos that you had to manage and that there was the fear of being sacked so you had a stick, but there were no carrots. And you spoke about a spreadsheet. It seemed very large. <laughs> and what was contained in those spreadsheets had to be rules. And so I'm afraid, Elizabeth, uh, from experience, I could have told you from inception that you were not going to succeed because you were drowning in conformance and you had very little time to focus on performance and to achieve the very purpose for which you were appointed, namely as a leader in the interest of the patient. Society um, is a franchise all. It's a franchise all for private sector entities, companies listed on the London Stock Exchange. People don't appreciate this. But today, the provider of capital to companies uh, is not in the main the wealthy family, as it was in the 19th century, certainly the first beginning of the 20th century. Today we have all become the providers of capital through pension funds, saving institutions. And we are the customer, the individual, the persons walking in the streets of London. And strangely enough, the patient is the provider of the capital for the hospitals. And so the very request from the leaders asking you to focus on financial reporting, actually forgetting that there are, were other uh, stakeholders of greater importance and those stakeholders were being ignored uh, to a degree. Um, when 
a board makes a decision. It's a collective mind. And the board you were leading, Elizabeth, when it made a decision, it was one collective mind. But I listened with fascination, and it seemed to me that you had a fragmented collective mind that you were leading. One needs to ensure that the collective mind is a unified one. One needs to have a very earnest discussion about what is the purpose of this entity. Do we all agree what is the purpose of this entity? Then what are the values that drive this entity? The value driver, which I, I give you an example, reliability was a value driver for FedEx. What the director said, if we're not reliable in delivering our parcels and documents, we're not going to have a reliable business. What were the value drivers of Midstaff? What were they? Were all the directors in agreement to the value drivers? And then who were the key stakeholders? Was the agreement who they were? And more importantly, did they know what the legitimate and reasonable needs, interests and expectations of those stakeholders were. Because if you didn't have common understanding on all those issues, you never had a unified collective mind. You had a fragmented one. And some, unfortunately, having the intellectual thinking fettered by those who had nominated them. So I think your story is a classic governance story. And uh, I, I salute you, Elizabeth, for having shared that with us. Thank you very much. Um, I was fortunate to know Mr. Mandela before he went to jail. Uh, while he was in jail, I communicated with him indirectly, and then after jail, we met again. He was an extraordinary person, because he was a person who appreciated that uh, without this freedom of forgiveness, one becomes one's own jailer. And um, I was a young clerk starting my legal career and the entrance to the magistrate's court in Johannesburg was in a street called Fox Street. And in a little one-story building was a firm of solicitors, Mandela and Tembo, solicitors. And at the bottom was Phyllis Peake, the prisoner's friend, ostensibly a business to grant bail for people subject to some collateral provided. But the South African police alleged this was nothing more than a front for a call girl business. And uh, Mr. Mandela used to tell the story with great glee that his first brush with the South African police was with the immorality squad, <laughs> who came to ask him to be a witness as to, quote, the goings on in the building. But. While he was in jail, I chaired an organization called Operation Hunger, in which we fed two and a half million children every day um, in the rural areas. When the press from England or wherever arrived in South Africa, they were in the urban areas. But the true hardship of apartheid was really in the rural areas. And we fed children, uh, two and a half million children every day. And um, one of Mr. Mandela's daughters worked in the organization, Zinzi. After he came out of jail, he had a lunch for 12 people. I was privileged to be one of the 12. And he went around the table saying why he'd invited each person to the, to the luncheon. And he came to me, and he always called me Judge. He said, Judge, um, I've invited you because Without Operation Hunger, there would have been another two and a half million citizens in South Africa who would have been useless individuals. 
because, as you all know, a baby and a child is not fed, the brain atrophies, and they do become useless members of society. He was a great caring individual. Then I had several meetings with him after that, and this perhaps the significant one was the one touched on by Mitzi. I got a call from him one day, how's my favourite judge? <laughs> now whenever he said that I knew he wanted me to do something which would involve a lot of work without remuneration. <laughs> and um, he actually wanted my advice on something and at the time I was chairman of two uh, very large uh, companies in uh, South Africa and uh, one listed in fact in London and in Europe and um, we were, this was 1991-92 and uh, we were going into an, our new democracy, a country of equal opportunity for one of unequal opportunity where the majority of our fellow citizens had not been in the mainstream of our economy. And the Institute of Directors, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants, etc., decided we need, needed some guidance for our directors as to how to direct and how to manage. At the time, many of you in the room will remember 89-90, Adrian Cadbury had been requested into ALIA by the LSE to write guidance for directors on, quote, the financial aspects of governance. So it was focused on the financial aspects. And I was dithering with it to do this, and in this conversation, I spoke to Mr. Mandela about it, and he said, you are the right man, do it. <laughs> so I did it, and it was one of my criteria that you came onto this committee, which then eventually assumed my name, became known as the King Committee, and one of the criteria was you got no remuneration. Put your hand on your heart, and you made the decision to make, to provide guidance in the best interests of our fellow citizens who had not been in the mainstream of our economy. And so I asked for a clean sheet didn't want to remit. And out of that clean sheet and the members of my committee were truly representative of our new rainbow nation, uh, came the concept of the inclusive approach to governance. Up to that time, we'd all been taught, we'd practiced, we'd nurtured on the exclusive approach. Um, the primacy of the shareholder the primacy, the provider of capital, equity-wise, as if this artificial person was surrounded, was on an island surrounded by a moat of shareholders, and occasionally a drawbridge would be let down so another stakeholder could come along in the society, as an example. Well, we said that in the decision-making process, a board should take account of the needs, interests and expectations of the stakeholders linked to that particular business, pertinent to that business, and make sure that you are making a decision in the best interest of the company for the maximization of total value. You'll notice I didn't say economic and I never said book value, because the accountants in the room and the NSC2 sitting in front of me We'll know that uh, book value, uh, the additives in the balance sheet according to international financial reporting standards in this part of the world, never equals the market cap of companies listed on the stock exchange. And so we developed what we said, directors have to apply intellectual honesty. The honest application of mind to the issue in the best interest of the company, unfettered, and taking account of these issues, having a unified mind with value drivers and the stakeholders, and understanding the purpose. Now, intellectual honesty. 
Well, directors have to act with good faith, care, skill and diligence, but I want to give some content to that. And I always give the example of the incapacitated young child of 18. Let's assume a person of 18 who is very close to you, heaven forbid a brother, got injured in a motor car accident today here in London and became incapacitated of mind and you asked to care for him for the rest of his natural life. None of you in this room, I suggest, would want anybody to think that you were a person that was trying to filch for yourself some benefit out of this unfortunate human being circumstance. You'd all apply your skills, whatever they were, voluntarily in the best interest of that unfortunate young human being. You would take great care in your decision making, take great care of his assets. You would diligently do your homework and understand his circumstances and plan for him short, medium and long term. Because the neurologist says to you physically he's fine, he'll live well into his 90s. Interesting, isn't it? Those are your duties as a director in the NHS. Good faith care, skill and diligence. But when you appreciate that an entity created in the NHS is a statutory body which has legal personality but is absolutely incapacitated and inanimate until you are appointed one of its leaders, you start feeling the duty of care, skill and diligence and understanding it. And why I've written to say that it takes courage to be a director because you become the heart, mind and soul of an incapacitated person that's absolutely dependent on you. And then we said you need to do that with responsibility, accountability, fairness and transparency. So. I've just got some, just look at responsibility. This is what we said about responsibility. The board should assume responsibility for the assets and actions of the company and be willing to take corrective action to keep the company on a strategic path that is ethical and sustainable. Accountability. Since at least the 1930s, we have focused on the annual financial statement. And we heard something of it in Elizabeth's talk, of the focus on financial results with the threat of being sacked. But is that being accountable? To report in IFRS speak, which to the average user of that report is in incomprehensible language. And um, as an experienced business person and having chaired several companies, I know that it has become complex. And after the failures at the beginning of the century of WorldCom, Tyco, uh, Enron, etc., the famous accounting set of stand standing bodies, the IASB and the FASB of America, said we have to improve the standards of financial reporting. So complexity was added to complexity. And what happened was that knowledge became lost in incomprehensible information. Is that being accountable? And I say, I always make the glib but very profound statement, to be accountable you have to be understandable. And has the NHS reported in an understandable manner so that the stakeholders, society at large, etc., has actually understood the difficulties you all have touched on by Elizabeth, the enormous task you all have? Has society understood what I called two years ago a pot of spaghetti? when I saw the structure that was being created with all the reporting levels. <coughs> I said you're going to spend a lot of time 
reporting to each other and filling in forms. And so you will commit the leadership sin of sloth because you're not really adding value. Conformance will drown out performance and you're not being accountable. The board should be able to justify its decisions and actions to stakeholders in understandable language. A critical cornerstone of integrated reporting. Then fairness. Can one really make a fair decision in the best interests of an NHS entity if the board as a whole hasn't identified the key stakeholders and understood the legitimate and reasonable needs, interests and expectations of those stakeholders. Because in making a decision in the best interest of that incapacitated entity, um, you have to balance these needs, interests and expectations. In the nature of things, you're going to benefit one and less so another, but you can explain it that it was in the interest of the entity, short, medium and long term. So fairness, the board should ensure that it gives fair consideration to the legitimate needs, interests and expectations of all stakeholders of the company. That the company is and is seen to be a good corporate citizen and acts free from discrimination or dishonesty and in conformity with rules and standards. Transparency. When uh, we wrote in the framework which was issued, uh, the board meeting was last week, but it was issued on Monday, 9th of December, that you must report in a transparent manner. We didn't mean nakedness. We didn't mean you had to tell everything, because then you wouldn't have a clear, concise report. What we meant was to move away from the natural human inclination to highlight positives and downplay negatives, to report in a balanced manner, so that the user, the reader, can understand and make a very informed assessment of your performance. The board should disclose information in a manner which enables stakeholders to make an informed assessment of the company's ability to sustain value creation. It must be easy to understand, candid, open and frank. So, let me go back to some of my slides. Um, where did we start? Well, we've been reporting and NHS is being controlled through a whole lot of financial and manufactured capital, your buildings, your hard assets. And yet, where did we all start? We actually started with natural assets. Go back to the 19th century. We can forgive those directors who saw a world of one billion people. It seemed to be a world with limitless resources and a world with an infinite capacity to absorb waste. We can forgive them because they could never have seen the population explosion of the 20th century because of the advance of medical science. But today we know there's 7 billion people on the planet. We know that in 30 years time there'll be another 2 billion people on the planet. And the demand for services, for product will increase. And yet we're dealing in a world with finite natural assets diminishing. So if you think you can carry on, as in the past, welcome to the age of stupidity. Think about it. And when you look at that graphic on the screen, we, with human capital, intellectual capital added, we built and developed the Industrial Revolution and landed up with financial and manufactured capital and ended up after the Great Depression reporting just on the financial and manufactured capital. That graphic illustrates exactly what happened around the world. 95, up to 1995, you had 
an extraordinary situation. Well, certainly at the turn of the century, you'll see 2000, between 95 and 2005, you had 80% of the value of companies listed on exchanges were not expressed as additives in a balance sheet. What were they? What was making up this value? Well, this started thought leaders in uh, Boston in America, and they developed the global, started the global uh, reporting initiative to set standards. <coughs> we have one of the founders in the room today, Dr. Lezadrenska. And um, standards were set for entities to start reporting on these non-financial aspects. An appreciation and a realization that reputation, the way society perceived the entity, the way you were conserving natural assets. Did you have a long-term strategic plan which seemed to the reader to make to be, enable the reader to make an informed assessment that business of this company will survive in the very changed world of the 21st century with climate change, financial crises, population explosion, the use of natural assets faster than nature is regenerating them, radical transparency, very changed world. Well. Um, all this led to a conclusion in Geneva at the United Nations. I chaired the United Nations on Governance and Oversight with Kofi Annan, who was then the Secretary General. And um, in 2002 onwards, I started talking about integrated reporting. And certainly by 2009, in what became known as King Three. I very expressly said, we have to think on an integrated basis. It's the only way we can do business in the 21st century. And we have to report in clear, concise and understandable language so that the true stakeholders can read and understand how we are performing. And I was invited to the United Nations in Geneva by IFAC, the International Federation of Accountants. Gordon Lidstrom and Ian Ball, the President and Chief Executive, were there. Some of the leaders of the Big Four were there. Um, IAASB, the Auditing and Assurance Standards Board. And it was Chatham House Rules. But at that meeting, this was towards the end of 2009, it was agreed that the way we had been reporting, we, public sector and private sector, was no longer fit for purpose. The question was what to do. The acceptance was financial reporting on its own critical, but not sufficient. Think it away, not being mandatory. Do non-financial reports according to the G4 guidelines as they now are, any other standard. Critical, but on its own not sufficient. Was it enough to have them in a silo, two silos in IFRS speak and sustainability speak? The answer was clearly in the negative. Well, all this led to um, a meeting at St. James's Palace, where I will be back on Thursday. We have an annual meeting there for this CY. Um, where the grace of uh, His Royal Highness Prince Charles, with huge convening power, he invited the who's who of corporate reporting, the invitation list being drawn up by Sir Michael Peat, of Peat Marwick fame, and me. Uh, we invited the chairman of the Global Reporting Initiative at the time, that was me, the chairman of Accounting for Sustainability, the trust started by Prince Charles in 2004, Sir Michael Peat, but much more importantly, the chairman of the International Accounting Standards Board, Sir David Tweedy, the chairman of the Financial Accounting Standards Board of America, and everybody accountants in the room will know about the debate for the last decade at least and the convergence of those two great financial standards, still not achieved. 
uh, the chairman of the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, president of the IIA, Institute of Internal Auditors, the world chairman of the Big Four, the president of the World Bank, the president of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the secretary general of the United Nations Environmental Programme, and the executive director of WWF. You start seeing disparate bodies, but they all received their gold embossed with three feathers on an invitation to this meeting at St. James Palace. No one said no. <laughs> they all arrived, and uh, we were all privileged to witness corporate history because it was agreed that the way of the future was integrated thinking and the integrated report. And so the International Integrated Reporting Council was formed with those bodies as the members and I'm privileged to be the chairman of that body. So integrated thinking. Well, whatever entity you are leading, directing, managing, being a party of, Entities use resources. We have focused for years on, where's the pointer? These two resources. But it's almost superfluous for me to add, the others were always present. Without human capital, intellectual capital, you wouldn't have had innovation and development. Natural assets are used every day. Some of them not owned by the very entity that uses them. Social capital is critical. Society, the relationship to your stakeholders. And so, let's look at uh, one of the great companies in the world, the Coca-Cola company, in its 125th or 6th year, I think it is. For 125 or 126 years, if I produced a Coca-Cola bottle here now without a name on, you would all know it's Coca-Cola. It's the best known brand in the world. Great marketing exercise. But for the last two years, the allegation, accusation, by civil society in America has been that the Coke is one of the causes for the obesity of our children. So on the 12th of May this year, start a new marketing campaign. That's a picture of a whole page in the Financial Times of the 12th of May. On all our containers, both cans and bottles, we will have uh, nutritional information. We will not market to children under the age of 12. We will develop with as low a calorie count as possible and we will support phys physical activities right around the world wherever we are present. Why? They realized that their product itself had an impact on their stakeholders and on society, financially and environmentally. Although they had nine years previously started their huge campaign to conserve water, realizing that the scarcest asset, natural asset on planet Earth and uh, one they had to conserve, otherwise they would go out of business. But here yeah, suddenly, they were dealing also with the impact of their product on society and the environment. So integrated thinking, and there is just another example, that was protests which I witnessed in the Champs-Élysées. Um, that's the after the collapse of the Bangladeshi building, you will all remember. And it took about two weeks and there was a pledge signed by the 24 great clothing retailers in the world that they formed an inspectorate to make sure the working conditions and living conditions of those workers in Pakistan and Bangladesh improved. Quite extraordinary impact. So in every institution you have inputs, you have your business activities, you have your product, but there are always outcomes. And integrated thinking goes from those inputs right through your business model to find simply how does this entity provide its product or service? How does it do it? Very interesting question which I've often asked as a non-executive director 
when I've come in as a new boy on a board. Mr. Chairman, may I through you ask the Chief Executive, I thank you for the induction and I've read the annual report. See the company made £294 million last year, but I don't read anywhere. Can the Chief Executive please explain to me how did the company make its money? Completely different thinking, isn't it? What we try to do here is to show you to think right across the inputs your business activities, your governance structure, you have your output, your service, but it always has an outcome. And it goes back again, and so you start. And the external environment, of course, will always be there to impact on us, such as the GFC happened. Five C's. Conscience. Intellectual honesty. The honest application of mind in the best interest of the entity you're representing. Casting aside all our intellectual baggage, past experiences, present needs, forgetting those who nominated you. Courage. Communication. Constant ongoing communication with your stakeholders so that management is informed what are the expectations of stakeholders? Are we fulfilling them? At every board meeting, there should be an agenda item of um, the stakeholders' expectations, stakeholder relationships. Some of the world's great companies have appointed a whole new corporate animal, the corporate stakeholder relationship officer. His or her sole job is to talk to stakeholders, inform management, what their needs, interests and expectations are. Management does a report to the board. So the board is informed right through the 12-month reporting cycle and can almost seamlessly do an integrated <coughs> report, which is a report using the information age where you can take your AFS, duly audited according to IS, put it online. But this unified collective mind would take out the material matter, explain it in clear, concise and understandable language, Equally so with a non-financial report. And then also explain how you've embedded the sustainability issues critical to that business into the long-term strategy so that the reader can make the informed assessment. The trustees of your pension funds can make the informed assessment the business of this company will continue to create value short, medium and long-term. Commitment. You've got to have time. You've got to apply your mind to these issues. And you've got to have the necessary skills. The appointment as a director is a two-way street. The board should do due diligence on the person concerned, and the person should do due diligence on the entity concerned. Because you might be joining a board with directors whose reputation has already been sullied. I conclude with two quotes. Winston Churchill, in writing a letter to his wife during the war years, a three-page letter, at the end of it said, if I'd had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. <laughs> and integrated reporting is akin to that Churchillian thinking. Apply your mind, more time extract that material information and explain it in clear, concise and understandable language. Helen Keller, that famous blind woman, said, one thing worse than being blind is having sight and no vision. I leave you with this thought. What is it you see about the NHS today? I see it as very conformance driven and still a lot of silos. It's going to take courage to talk to the powers that be to make sure that you focus on quality and not quantity. Thank you very much.